Welcome everybody, good to have you with us. Um, I want to, before we do all the introductions of the partners, everybody, one of the main partners of uh, the Annapolis Summit uh, for the last 10 years uh, has been Stevens University in Baltimore, Maryland, and uh, Kevin Manning is its president. He's been president for 13 years. The university has exploded. As I was driving down uh, Route 83 the other morning to our studios, I saw this sign flashing, and it said, Stevenson University girls hockey team. A girls hockey team in Baltimore? But it happens. Right. Kevin Manning. Ice hockey. Yeah, we have <laughs> with the uh, southernmost uh, uh, ice hockey program in the country in NCAA, so the ice starts to melt when it gets to Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to figure out how we do that. But we do have a rink, and we have about 26 players from all over the country. That's two, great. two Canadian coaches, and uh, we, the, the team is, uh, is doing well. Yeah. So, Kevin, let's just start to talk about why you uh, uh, and Stevenson University decided to kind of sponsor and back right. this well, whole we Annapolis just, Summit. Well, we just, you know, as an educational institution, we're always interested in focusing people's attention on the right things. And, you know, we just feel that uh, the opening of the session every year is an important public event, and uh, we want to endorse it. We want um, to promote it and to make sure that our students and others, other citizens in the community uh, pay as much attention to it as, as they should. So how does it fit into your agenda, though? I mean, why the into Stevens University's agenda? Yeah, well, I mean, I think basically these things are certainly good visibility for, for the institution, and uh, more people know about us as a result of this. And we just really like to be associated with quality, quality shows. Like how many are you now, student-wise? So we have 3,200 full-time students, and then we have a uh, School of Graduate and Professional Studies, which is our online division. And we have a new $150 million campus in Owings Mills and a new stadium, and we just bought another campus. And we're hoping to complete that, all those acquisitions in Owings Mills over the next year with one final campus, which will give us about 300 acres. A long way from Villa Julie. Yeah, it's been <laughs> a, lot of, a, lot of a lot of changes in 12 years, yeah. From a little girl's college to a right. major yeah. university. Yeah, and we're, you know, we're really proud of our students and proud of our faculty and staff and all the good things that are going on. So I want to just commend you on the great job that you're doing, and Thank congratulations you. on 10 years. Thank you. Kevin Thank Manning. You. Thanks for having me. Yay. Ray, welcome. This is Mark Steiner, and we're here uh, in Annapolis at our 10th annual Annapolis Summit from the Calvert House in Annapolis, uh, along with our uh, co-host, Mark Steiner Show, of course, from the EAA, uh, and our co-host, the Baltimore Business Journal. The last 10 years, we've been sponsored by Stevenson University. They're with us as well. And the Maryland State Education Association, the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development, and the Maryland, and Maryland Business for Responsive Government are our key sponsors this year for this event. And we always start the program off with uh, our president of the Maryland Senate, Mike Miller, and the Speaker of the House, Michael Bush, uh, this is Michael Bush. This is your 10th year as well. 11th. 11th, excuse me. I mean, take, away, take away a year. 11th year and 26 years. The longest standing president of the Senate in the United States of America. Is that right? Okay. Yes, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, both, both per poster child for term limits. Aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> the longest uh, standing speaker of the House in Maryland, Mike Bush. And with that comes... A lot of responsibility. I mean, what, is it, what, <laughs> what does that? I'm just curious. What does that mean for, for the two of you? And this is not really a softball. It's a very serious question. Um, when you sit in an office for 26 years or 11 years, whatever that number is, yeah. you accumulate a huge amount of power and and a lot of influence. Um, you call some shots. You say things come to the floor. Things don't come to the floor. Mm -hmm. Um, you have members to wrangle. You probably have more dif diverse <laughs> members to wrangle than the president, but you have members to wrangle. So what, what, for you, what, what comes with that? What is the responsibility that comes with 26 years of that kind of power without that power becoming overwhelming for the rest of the system? What you do, you share the power. You, 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 you let the power come from the, from the back to you. You appoint the very best people to do the job. And, um, and then you give them the power, you let them sponsor the bills, they have the public hearings, and they decide whether the bills come to the floor. So you empower the committee system, you empower the members, and, uh, and, and they do the work, and they get the glory. Yeah, I, I think, uh, to follow up on the, on the president, uh, you know, you, you have to be surrounded by good people, and you have to keep the confidence in the body, and the only way you do that is to empower the members of uh, the General Assembly. I mean, you put them on committees that they have an interest in the work on. Uh, you include them in the uh, 
agenda that you want to put forward. Uh, you, you forward their legislation, you give them the credit. Uh, but I do think, uh, you know, being in office for a period of time gives you some real experience as well. I mean, you have an understanding of, of the state budget and the uh, structure of state government, and I think it's, it's more complex than people want to uh, make it out to be, and I think uh, experience means a lot, not only for the presiding officers, but also the uh, chairman and leadership of both houses. I think the experience has played a key role in any successes that we've had. So uh, this session clearly is not going to be a session that's going to have, uh, it will have its share of rancor, no question, and cooperation, but it won't be, it, it won't have the kind of issues facing it the last couple of years, especially the last year, no. with the special sessions that took place and, and the rest and the huge deficit the state was facing, still facing a deficit. But one of the major issues that you have to wrestle with is this transportation trust fund that has been depleted. I mean, all the fiscal managers are saying that within five years, there'll be no money there for anything. Um, and that we've been raiding that trust fund for as long as both of you men have been in, in, the, in the House and Senate uh, to pay for the government that we, we decided to kind of take money from the trust fund rather than raise taxes. Now there's no money in the trust fund to build the, the rail lines that are supposed to be built or to even fix the roads we have. So where do we go? I mean, what is the solution to this? This is actually, in some levels, almost as big as the face in the deficit because we're talking about the infrastructure of the state of Maryland. Well, I mean, you know, Bill Gates said he could solve a federal problem in five minutes. I could solve it in a half an hour. I mean, it, it takes a half an hour. Half an hour. I mean, honestly, it takes compromises on both sides. Democrats are going to have to give up on entitlements, folks. There needs to be means testing. Uh, I mean, wealthy people like myself shouldn't have to, shouldn't, shouldn't get the same benefits as some, some person that doesn't have any resources. Uh, you know, 65 doesn't mean what it meant in my grandfather's age. Uh, Democrats have got to give up on some entitlements, but at the same time, the, the amount of money that they came up with doesn't begin to solve the problem. So you need more revenue and you need more cuts. And uh, it's got to be people coming together saying this is America, the wealthiest, most powerful nation in the world, we can solve this problem. Just as we've solved the problems every, every generation. Uh, the same is true of transportation. Uh, it, means, it means sacrifices. I know how to solve the problem. I can't get the votes to solve the problem, okay? What it means is that a gas tax increase, but that only solves the problem for roads and bridges, okay, and maintenance. Uh, we, need, we need the urban areas where mass transit is, the red line and the purple line, to pay a little bit more. And, and if you get those two combinations, Republicans and Democrats will both vote for the gas tax, and I can get people to vote for a, a, a regional transit tax as well. And we can solve the state's problems, but it's very difficult. We need the speaker, the governor, myself, and everybody on board. Everybody says no, but coming together, we can make it happen. But it takes hard work. All right. Uh, well, let me just make one comment. Uh, you know, we've raised the Transportation Trust Fund to make sure that uh, our constitutional priority of education has been taken care of when we fully funded education, even in the toughest of times. Well, we paid that transportation trust fund back. What we haven't done is uh, we've diverted the highway user money that goes to counties, and municipalities, into the general. Seven hundred million dollars, right? Uh, I don't know exactly what the total cost is, uh, Mark, but uh, <clears throat> you know it, it's like this: it's your, you, uh, we're going through a recessionary period. If you, you were a homeowner and you had to pay your mortgage and you had to raid your child's college trust fund to stay in your house, you'd probably do that. Uh, so, I mean, we weren't responsible for the recession. The financial markets on Wall Street were. Uh, everyone went over, over the cliff. And different states have made different uh, resolutions to how they're going to solve the problems. You know, we had a $2 billion deficit, and, and we've basically <coughs> done away with it in two years at the same time that we had to get weaned off of $3.8 billion worth of stimulus money. The stimulus money actually kept us uh, afloat, and we were very happy to have received it. But once that ran out, we had had to make the tough decisions of pension reform, taking furlough days, downsizing government, uh, you know, cutting programs, as well as raising revenues. So I think if everybody takes a deep breath all through this, reg uh, this period of time, uh, I think the state has kept its priorities in line. We've continued to fully fund K-12 through education. Four years in a row, number one in the country. There's a good chance we're going to be five years in a row. So rumor has you, it. You look in the Washington Post and you <clears throat> see where the other states are going with their university tuitions, the public universities, making it tougher for middle class and working class families to afford uh, a college education. In Maryland, we've kept it uh, low to a 2% increase. 
Uh, we've gone from the six highest to the 26 highest. Our community colleges are, are, are splitting at the seams because kids are going there and we have a path for kids to get that education and experience the American dream. And that's why we have the highest median income in the country of any state in the union because we have a well-educated workforce and businesses want to settle here. Our unemployment rates are point below the national average. So when we had to make the tough decisions of balancing the budget and getting into almost a balanced budget doing away with our structural deficit, <clears throat> we funded what I believe are our priorities. Now, do we need the Transportation Trust Fund uh, solution? We need a transportation plan and we need a way to, to fund it. But it does take the 71 votes and 24 votes in the Senate to do it. But I think coming through this recessionary period, uh, the governor and the, and the legislature had to make some very tough decisions, and I think they made the right ones. But in, but in so, fairness, in fairness to, to, to why I agreed to it is that the money came from the sales tax revenue. It didn't come from the gas tax revenue. We raised the sales tax ascent, but we said half the sales tax revenue goes in the Transportation Trust Fund. And once we put the money in the Transportation Trust Fund, I felt that we were, were, were legally entitled to take that money and apply it to education and other needs of the state. Which is what happened. So the question, some people are arguing um, that the Transportation Trust Fund, if we're, if the, if we're gonna have a gas tax, we'll talk about that in a minute, see if that feasibility is, or any other kind of tax to, to uh, put more money in the Transportation Trust Fund, um, some senators are saying that we should ha it should be like a lockbox. You put the money in the fund, it can't come out, otherwise we're just gonna do the same thing over and over again, which is not figure out how to raise revenues and take it out of the Transportation Trust Fund and use it for whatever we need, which would be education. That's, that's part of the right? ultimate solution. I mean, if you, to get the votes you needed to pass this, that's gonna have to be part of the equation. To lock it. Yes. Let, let me just make one observation. It's not good government, but it's gonna have to happen. May, may, no, one observation. It takes, 85, it takes 85 votes to do that. And, and the people- it takes 85 are, votes to do what? To put it on the ballot. It's gotta be a constitutional amendment to put it on the ballot. Uh, I believe it's 29 in the Senate, and uh, it takes 85 in the House. Uh, that's a tough number for you to reach. Well, when you struggle to reach 71, the idea that you're going to get to 85 uh, becomes uh, a, a large mountain to climb. Uh, so, I, you know, I think uh, we have uh, an obligation, uh, particularly in the Washington metropolitan area, which competes with Northern Virginia, uh, of who's going to have the best transportation system in that area, because I think that's what the economy and the job market there is. But we also have great challenges in the Baltimore region with school construction in Baltimore City and Baltimore County. Have That's coming up. Second, second oldest stock of uh, schools uh, in, in the state of Maryland. And uh, for them to be successful, uh, they need that infrastructure. So there's two ty different types of infrastructure uh, that, that we do need to address. So I don't want to get stuck in transportation here because there's so much to talk about. But I, the, the, some of the things you just brought up here um, uh, are, are the issues like uh, the school construction, which is going to come up. Baltimore's asking for, what is it, $30 million a year they're asking for? Whereas Baltimore's asking for $32 million a year so they can float a bond to raise the billions they need to restructure their schools. That, that, that's fairly accurate. What they're asking for is a commitment of 30 some million a year for 20 years. Right. And then to form a nonprofit to be able to go to the private market to see exactly. if they can raise the which money. Which they've done in other cities. Well, let me, let me, let me just say this. I mean, uh, you know, you have to scrutinize that to make sure the state is not liable if anything happens in that situation. Uh, we're one of the few states to put money up for school construction, period. You know, the, the goal was $250 million a year under the COP Commission about eight years ago. Under Governor O'Malley uh, and the legislature, we put up $2.5 billion in six years, $2.5 billion in six years in school construction. Almost one third of our capital budget of our total capital budget is school construction money. And it's necessary, you need it. And we still need more money uh, for school construction. But what's the argument for and against in your minds, consist places like Baltimore, getting that money for 20 years to float a bond? I mean, because when you go to Baltimore, and you both have been there. You, know, right. you don't borrow debt against debt. I mean, it's ridiculous. We got to, I'm, I'm for funding the schools, but you find another funding source. And you know what you have to realize, I mean, the Baltimore Business Journal is here is also. We, we're the wealthiest state in the union but guess what? We have the 41, uh, we're 41 in terms of business taxation. That's not good. And one of the reasons is that we're one of only five states that funds public schools. I mean, when I was coming along, I mean, you know, I, I, I was grades one through 12 in the same school building. We had to have Frank Small used cars on the back of our uniforms. I mean, it was just what it is. I mean, and then in the 70s, Baltimore City, you know, had, had, had the problems. And so 
under Marvin Mandel, we said, look, the states got in the business of building schools. We're one of only five states that does that. One of only five states that does that. And it's good that we do that, but there's, we've also got to bring this tax down. You know, and, and we're, we're the only state in the union that gives money to the counties in Baltimore City. The only state in the union that does that. You know, largely because of the needs and problems of Baltimore City. My little county, Calvert County, which does need to get $60 million a year from the state. Montgomery County gets a billion dollars a year from the state. The only state in the union to hold property taxes down to help them with the schools. So there's a, a delicate balancing act. We need to find money to help Baltimore City help itself, but we're not gonna, we can't get more and more debt because it just leads to a, you know, problems with our budget situation. But again, from the city's perspective and from the schools in, the, in Baltimore's perspective, they're saying that this has been shown it can be paid back. Uh, if, if, the city, if the city puts its money in, that it commits to its school system and advances that and the state advances money, that bond can be paid off. What they're asking for is $35 million of a pot of money from a, from a different governor, from a different legislature for 20 years. And it, it's, it's dead. Um, Baltimore City cannot meet its current fiscal obligations. We, not, we need to find a way to help them help themselves. But you can't do it by just piling more debt onto more debt. What's your take, Mike Bush? Look, I, it, you know, it, this to me is, is kind of an innovative method. Uh, I, I haven't made a final opinion on it, but the president of the Senate is right. They're asking for a 20-year commitment. Baltimore County is thinking about picking back on that commitment. So you would have to draw up in, in the law that for 20 years, each of these subdivisions would have to get a minimum amount of money for school construction. Right now, they probably get under O'Malley maybe, uh, you know, 50 million a year. Uh, under the former governor, Governor Ehrlich, they were getting 25 million a year, maybe 28 million a year. So you, you'd, you'd have to guarantee them that money and you, you would hold other legislators and governors accountable to that. Then they would have to form a nonprofit, go out into the private market to get somebody to finance their portion of the match to the state's guarantee of how much money they're getting. So it becomes pretty complex. Uh, and as the President of the Senate says, you're, you're taking bond funding that you're writing, underwriting because each of these bonds are, have a 15-year lifespan. I'm talking about it on a year-to-year -year basis. And now you're asking for 20 years to have that, that uh, same lifespan of, of state bond. Uh, let, let, let me just say this, too, uh, in the school construction area. We give more money to uh, the poor subdivisions than wealthier subdivisions. Baltimore City, for argument's sake, 93% of their school construction dollars come from the state. They only have to put up 7%. Why Comico County, 96% comes from the state of Maryland. You know, a lot of times you hear about, uh, you know, just Baltimore City, but there's a lot of poor counties out there getting 80, 75% of their funding from the state of Maryland for their school construction and for their education operating expenses. Uh, so we're, we're a state that balances out an equitable uh, uh, education for every child. So I'm gonna encourage people to go to the mic whenever you're ready. We'll get some of your questions in and out of here as we talk to the president and the uh, speaker. The mic is to my left. Please feel free to get up there. Um, before I ask a question about the death penalty, you, you talked about a constitutional amendment. And one of the things I was thinking about reading the paper this morning is, 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 is the referendum question. The referendums that hit the ballot last year in some ways changed the nature of the game in Maryland. I mean, in terms of what was passed both of the Dream Act and the same-sex marriage, those things um, were game changers in terms of the future politics, I think, in some ways in the state of Maryland. Congressional redistricting. That as well. Um, so, but I understand, at least from the papers, that, y that you're considering pulling back or making it harder for referendums to get on the ballot. Is that right? Not making it harder, and, and, and I'm not proposing it, but there's different, there's inconsistencies in the count. In the, for example, in the counties, to put something on referendum, it requires 5% of the population, and the, for the state, it requires 3% of the population. And also, when our forefathers envisioned it, it envisioned two people, you know, a person with a petition, a person signing it, and a person witnessing their petition. Because of technology, you have the same person signing and witnessing his or her own signature. So it, it, that was a matter for the court, it was a divided court. Uh, I think the court was four to three on that issue in terms of whether we needed two people uh, to participate in the process. Those issues are going to be debated. Yeah, yeah. And I don't have much to add to that. I, I think the, you know, the modern technology has changed the dynamics of the game, and I think you do have to review it and look at it. Uh, I think the vast majority of people, you know, uh, a petition to the ballot should be an exceptional thing. Uh, exceptional? 
Some people think it should be the, it's the foundation of democracy, like in California. We, if something goes on, you put it on the ballot. Well, let me just say, it's much different here than it is in California. In California, they can petition things to the ballot. Here, uh, they can only petition things to the ballot that have, have come through the uh, legislative process. So it's a totally different process uh, than California as far as that is concerned. But I, I do believe uh, when they set up the Constitution of Maryland, that uh, you know, in a representative democracy, they expect that their elected officials make the vast majority of the decisions. And uh, the only thing you can petition to the ballot is a revenue uh, initiative here in the state of Maryland. Uh, so I think you need to review it, and uh, you know, you might stay in the same posture that you have. Uh, you're probably going to have more things on the ballot. One of the issues coming, I think, will come up. We'll see what the governor says in the next hour. Will be the death penalty and ending the death penalty in the state of Maryland. Um, you said, you've been quoted as uh, President Miller saying that you would let it come to the floor. Sure. So what does that mean? What it means is that uh, if, if there are the votes there, you know, uh, opinion changes constantly. And uh, the Speaker and I have a great deal of power, a great deal of authority is given to us by our forefathers. And that's, we get to name the chairman of the committees and members of the member of the committees. And then you, so by doing so, you have an opportunity to be fair, unfair, what have you. And uh, neither he nor I want to be say that we're totally responsible for bottling up an issue that the public once debated uh, for the Senate. Uh, so my position is if, if, a, if a bill has support in the floor of the Senate and uh, can pass on the floor of the Senate and has been bottled up in the committee by a vote of six to five, two years in a row, I want to find a vehicle to have that bill brought to the floor of the Senate. Uh, I think it'll come to the floor of the Senate. I think if the governor uses his persuasive techniques, uh, which he has many, I think it uh, <laughs> does. Uh, I think the bill will pass the Senate, quite frankly, by a vote of one or two votes. I think it'll go to the House, and I think it'll pass the House. And uh, there'll be a number of amendments, it'll be a you know, very difficult debate, and I think it'll be petitioned to referendum, just like these others have, <coughs> and I think the public will have an opportunity to vote on it in the next uh, general election. So, but you've, you've historically not been against the death penalty, is that right? Or have you been? Have I what? Been opposed to the death penalty. I continue to be opposed to it. I mean, I, no, I continue to support the That's death penalty. That's what I'm penalty. saying. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and I continue to support it for people who assassinate teachers in the classrooms, in addition to the corrections officers, in addition to the policemen. Uh, honestly and truly, I mean, the sniper was in my area. The D.C. sniper was in my area. He changed his clothes on my property, you know. Uh, these, these people in Newtown, Connecticut, Columbine, Virginia Tech, uh, there needs to be an ultimate consequence for people, mass murderers. The last person we executed in the state traumatized, sodomized three separate women before he executed them. It's a mass murder. Uh, and he got his just rewards. So uh, how about you? Look, I, I think Mike. the entire debate was changed when we had life without parole. I mean, you put people in jail forever and they don't come out. Uh, in some respects, it makes the debate on death penalty uh, a uh, compelling debate, I think, to repeal the death penalty. We're, we're one of the few progressive countries in the world that even have the death penalty anymore. Um, so, you know, under the uh, circumstances we have with life without parole in the state of Maryland, the fact that I think uh, the state of Maryland, because you have 24 different state's attorneys that ask for the death penalty or don't ask for the death penalty, uh, makes it inconsistent. I mean, you'll never see the death penalty asked for in Montgomery, Prince George's, or Baltimore City. At least I haven't seen it done since I've been in office where you see it in some of the more uh, uh, rural areas of the state. So uh, it is a philosophic approach, but I, I believe it's uh, time to take a serious look at repealing the death penalty. You see the answer for it in Anne Arundel County, where a person serving life without parole kills a prison guard. You know, what else do you do to the person? I sponsored life without parole. That's my bill. Uh, because I wanted life, life without parole, or the death penalty, give the, 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 an option. But a, a person serving life without parole is there and assassinates a prison guard. Or like in Prince George's County, a person laid in wait and assassinated a state police officer wearing a uniform. Or a person lays in wait in, in, in New England and assassinates firefighters coming to the rescue. Uh, I think those are appropriate cases for the death penalty. Because people also, go ahead, Mike. Look, let me just say this. I mean, this is a, a classic part of the debate. Uh, the people were passionate on both sides, just like it was civil marriage and was the DREAM Act. Uh, and quite candidly, I don't know exactly where uh, the members of the, of the House are. Where do you stand on it? I said, I, I believe it's time to repeal the death penalty. Uh, I think with life without parole and the way it's uh, distributed, I think uh, it's time to take that serious consideration and go forward. Uh, but at the same token, 
uh, we're not going to take the bill up first in the House. They're going to take it up in the Senate. And, there, and as the President of the Senate said, there'll be some very tough amendments that people will have to vote on. Because the things he's talking about, they're going to have to vote up or down on the amendments. It's not just an up and down vote on the, uh, on the uh, bill itself. So if you are opposed to it, I mean, if, if, you, are, if you are support the death penalty, why are you letting it on the floor? I, you know, I, I'm a Democrat, and I believe in democracy. I mean, honestly and truly. It's a, let me, let me you know, it's just, I mean, I'm, look, I study history. I'm a historian. And it, well, the reason I'm able to stay around so long is, you know, I, I, I try to avoid the, the, the mistakes of my predecessors. You know, wherever they are, and just you, 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 you got a bull by the tail, you let the bull go. You know what I mean? Let me defend the president of the Senate here because I mean I think he was pretty clear on civil marriage that he was not for it, but he let it come to the floor yeah. of the Senate, and it passed the Senate, and that's a credit to uh, the president of the Senate to do that. I mean, I mean, I think it's a credit to him and the way he leads his chamber is the fact that he let that bill come to the floor of the Senate, even though he was out front and said I'm not going to support the bill. I don't know, you, you guys get along so well, I'm getting a little scared. Maybe I should just cancel the summit. But I think we'll, we'll see where that goes. I think, and I think there are other issues that we want to raise here just about the criminal justice system in general. The question of parole has come up. I'm going to talk about it, about it come back from break. Um, uh, that I think is, may not come up on the floor this year, but we're one of only three states in the nation where the governor has a say in parole. And, uh, and there's a lot of issues around that. I'm going to raise those issues as well. But we're going to take a very brief break, though. Uh, you listen to the Mark Steiner Show at the 10th Annual Annapolis Summit, WEAA, and our co-host, uh, Baltimore Business Journal, of course, our sponsor, Stevens University. Uh, for this event, we're here at the Calvert House in Annapolis with the President of the Senate and the Speaker of the House, Mike Miller and Mike Bush, respectively. We're going to take a brief break and come right back, so don't go away. Welcome back. Uh, we're here at the Calvert House in Annapolis for the 10th Annual Annapolis Summit. Uh, this is Mark Steiner from the Mark Steiner Show, WEAA 88.9 FM, the voice of the community, uh, along with uh, our partners, the Baltimore Business Journal and Stevenson University, the Maryland State Education Association, the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development, and the Maryland Business for Responsive Government. We're here with the President of the Senate, Mike Miller, and the Speaker of the House, Michael Bush. Uh, and I'm going to turn this over to our audience, and as we always do, the first question out goes to our other uh, partner in public radio in the state, uh, Delmarva Public Radio. Go ahead. Yeah, Don Rush here. Um, in the aftermath of the Newtown shooting, uh, there's been some, suggest some suggestion, certainly by the governor, that there might be some kind of um, gun control coming out of the state legislature. And he a suggestion, for instance, there might be a ban on assault weapons. Where do you see this gun control issue going in the state legislature, and do you see some kind of effort to ban uh, assault weapons in, uh, in, in Maryland? Where are you on that? Uh, we previously voted to ban them, and I believe we'll renew that vote. Uh, I think the assault weapons will be banned, and I believe the, uh, the larger magazines will be banned as well. Uh, I don't believe there'll be any major infringement on the Second Amendment in terms of right to bear arms. Uh, we have very tight laws in Maryland. Uh, we have one gun a month. Uh, we have uh, background checks for everybody who wants to purchase a gun. Uh, the, the, the caveat to what I've just said is that we need to find some way to, to combine mental health uh, issues with those people who wish to purchase guns. And so we're going to look at that area as well. Uh, just to follow up on that, uh, I think one of the things you need to do here is review all the laws you already have in the state of Maryland. And, and see what uh, really we have in effect. I mean, there's three areas of the law that we're talking about, that President Senate talked about, uh, the issue of mental health and funding mental health and making sure that they don't have access to, to guns uh, of any sort, and that uh, there's the uh, public safety uh, issues, public safety in schools, and then you have uh, what's the real need for a semi-automatic weapon. I think even the most avid hunter uh, will tell you that they never use a semi-automatic weapon or a, a large uh, uh, clip of uh, bullets uh, for hunting. Uh, and uh, so what's the necessity uh, in this day and age in society to have any semi-automatic uh, weapons? And I think those are the things that will be discussed. I think we'll fine-tune that. I think when uh, the head of the NRA came out and talked about putting, uh, you know, policemen in every school, vast majority of high schools, middle schools in the state of Maryland have what they call safety resource officers, SROs, that are already in the school system. And I think 
part of that is why we've prevented a lot of any of these incidents ever taking place, uh, because we have taken that precaution here in the state of Maryland uh, already. But uh, you have to uh, make sure you know what you, what you have here in the state and how you can prevent uh, any uh, incidents uh, that took place in Newtown uh, from, from uh, taking place here. Uh, having uh, security folks who carry guns in, in schools, security uh, personnel at schools uh, carrying guns? Look, I, here's what I believe. I, I, you know, I leave it up to law enforcement. They have, like I say, safety resource officers at every high school, middle school in the county. Uh, they know exactly how to run the school, who's suspicious when they come to the school. Exactly, uh, they're in charge of the public safety uh, of that school system. And, uh, you know, I'm going to let uh, every uh, police organization determine uh, what measures uh, they need to make sure that their schools are protected. It, just a quick one, I'll get out of here. Um, what was your reaction when you heard the news about the new town? Mine was I was sickened and then enraged. And then I said somebody ought to do something about that. And then that somebody is people in elected office like me. Right. Mike? I'm just traumatized. I have 14 grandchildren. I couldn't believe what those parents, those grandparents are going through. That's right, yeah. The, the, so the, one of the things about that is that people are arguing, and we'll talk about, with the governor when he comes in the next hour, is that when you talk about safety in schools, part of it is mental health. And I don't know where the funds come from, but I'll ask this directly. I mean, how do you begin to put in funds in our schools that allow for school psychologists, counselors to really do the job that they're supposed to? Because that's and also, as my as my 15 year old said. She said, when I was in elementary school, they had doors that led outside. So if a fire thing happened, we could just get outside. Why didn't they have that at Newtown? Why don't they have, why don't they have it in our schools now? Are, are there ways that you can, we can do things that, that, um, that actually address that without the measures of locking down and having security guards with guns, giving teachers guns and the rest? Our schools can't be everything to everybody. They can't, you know, but no. you were just saying you're outraged about Newtown. So no, but I mean, in terms of, I'm, we're talking about diagnosis of, 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 of children and mental health and things of that nature. They, they have a very tough job. They do the very best they can under the circumstances. It's a, mental health is a very complicated issue, and uh, it's, it's, it's very hard to define, very hard to, to especially young people, in terms of uh, understanding what type of treatment needs to be needed. And our schools are already overtaxed, and uh, to ask them to pick up these additional burdens is, is, uh, is asking quite a bit. Quite a bit. Next question. Good morning. My name is Jen. I work with the Maryland League of Conservation Voters. And uh, happy first day of session. I want to commend um, both Speaker uh, Bush and President Miller for your great leadership last session. We made a lot of progress in terms of cleaning up the Chesapeake Bay, which continues to be one of our priorities this coming session. And President Miller, I also want to commend you for um, recently renewing your commitment to cleaning up the bay and uh, not retiring until, until we pass the policies needed. This session, one of our priorities is to finish the job. We want to defend the progress we made last session and also pass legislation to clean up our communities and create, generate re resources uh, needed through um, uh, addressing bag, uh, pollution from plastic bags and litter. And I wanted to ask both of you what you anticipate this session in terms of that bill and also um, finishing the job and cleaning up the Chesapeake Bay. I think the bag issue is uh, it's a bag tax. Uh, if you go into uh, the other banks in North Carolina, they have a bag tax to, 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 for people in the grocery stores and what have you, just to, to encourage recycling. Um, uh, it's the law in Montgomery County, and I think it will be adopted on a regional basis, quite frankly. I think it will it'll perhaps be the law in Prince George's County uh, before it becomes a statewide law. I think eventually it will be a statewide law, but I think it will occur on a county-by-county county basis first. Yeah, I, I think we took that bill up in committee last year, as you know, uh, Chairman McIntosh had that, and it, it was a question back and forth between Prince George's County. And uh, it'll be back again this year, so. Thank you. Ed. Thank you. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. My name is uh, Gary Brennan. I'm with the Frederick County Teachers Association. Uh, my question is about charter schools. Uh, Maryland's current charter school law is one of the strongest and best in the, in the nation. Uh, it provides local control, accountability, and opportunities for innovative instruction. Recently, some charter school proponents have been talking about weakening that law, giving new uh, authorizing authority, taking power away from local school boards to authorize charters. So my question to you is, do you support the current 
charter law as it's uh, written, or we, are you uh, going to be looking at changes to Maryland's very good charter school law? I'm not looking at changes, but uh, from the charter school perspective, it's the weakest law in the nation. You know what I mean? Uh, there needs to be a healthy balance. There needs to be a healthy balance. Bill Clinton was one of my uh, great friends and person I looked to. He, he promoted charter schools. Uh, there's a role for charter schools. And there needs to be a balance between charter schools and the public schools. I'm not certain we've found that yet, but there needs to be uh, a dialogue between the strongest and weakest. Both argue they're the strongest, and as you said, you're, it's the strongest law. They say it's the weakest law. Uh, so we'll continue to work with you. If I could real, real yes, quick. Yes, go ahead. Uh, sure. Frederick County was the first county to have a charter school yeah. uh, in the state of Maryland, and the law is working there. Uh, and the schools that we have good charter schools, because they're accountable to our school board uh, and to the, the citizens of, of Frederick County. So I'm just hoping that you uh, maintain that kind of uh, accountability. Thank you. So the follow-up on what he was saying, when it comes to education, <clears throat> Thornton's fully funded. Maryland schools have been named at the top of the country for the last four years. We'll see what happens this year. Um, and so all that is moving in the right direction. The question is, where, do we, where does it go now? What's the next level? The one, thing that, the one thing that the state has to do is fund education. That's in our Constitution. Right. Um, and some people have been talking about the geographic cost of education index. Should that become law? Should we be putting that in stone so that that parts of the state that do not get, that have the greatest needs, get money. Where, where, do, you, where do we take it next? Uh, first of all, I mean, the geographic index, I mean, it is fully funded. Uh, we did that with the stimulus money. You couldn't fund the existing programs, so you fully funded GCEI. And your second question about how do you take care of poor subdivision, it's a formula-based uh, uh, initiative where poor subdivisions get more money than wealthier subdivisions. Uh, Montgomery County only gets 34% of their school funding from the state. Uh, Wicomico County gets 78% uh, of their school funding from the state. Cecil gets 62% from the state, almost two-thirds. So a lot of your rural areas, Somerset, Caroline, a lot of people think it's just Baltimore City, but it's Allegheny, it's Garrett. All those people get more money uh, from the state than we put in. And really wealthy counties like Montgomery, Anne Arundel, Howard County uh, are funding uh, a lot of those because you have a... Uh, equitable formula that every child gets the same amount of money that goes into the classroom. And I think uh, that's been the backbone of our, our system here. And to go back to the charter schools, uh, I think we have a pretty good charter school law in the state of Maryland. And I think when you compare it to other states, you have to realize that other states have local school boards with taxing autonomy. No school board in the state of Maryland has the right uh, to, uh, to property tax. They go through their county council. Uh, to meet uh, what we call the maintenance effort to keep up with the funding uh, allocations that the state puts forward. You know, I, you know every, everybody, everybody does it a little bit different, but uh, we make certain that from the poorest county to the wealthiest county, uh, we have quality schools. Forty percent of our budget goes to the public school system. Uh, we've got, again, I don't want to keep reiterating, but number one for the last four years in a row, and we don't want it to go down on our watch. I mean, last year, $396 million in school construction when we're only one of five states in the union that does that. I mean, it's, uh, uh, I'm very proud of that. I'm the oldest of 10 children, went to public schools, and I'm glad that happened on my watch, the Thornton formula. I'm going to continue to, to fund it, and uh, we want to make sure that the poor areas are taken care of. But at the same time, uh, our state is doing very well in terms of funding education. Also, uh, higher education. The University of Maryland now went to the fourth best Public edu fourth best value in public education, higher education. You know, I think it was helped by joining the Big Ten, but also the our academic uh, improvements over the years have just just have skyrocketed. We're in doing well. This Dream Act is improving our uh, community colleges from K through 12 and higher education. Our state of Maryland is doing excellent. Hi, good morning. My name is Amy Chase. I'm from the Biotechnical Institute of Maryland in Baltimore. My question is about wind energy and the momentum for uh, the legislation this year. The federal government has now uh, renewed their interest in wind energy. There's the tax credits have been renewed. There's new committee assignments. There's more businesses than, be ever, than ever behind wind energy. Uh, climate change is now a household name. We applaud your efforts here in Maryland to combat climate change and to work on renewable energy. CO2 emissions are down in the state, but we're still too dependent on imported energy. Can you tell me what, what the ideas or what the momentum is behind the wind energy again this year for this session? 
Wind energy will pass the uh, General Assembly this session. Okay. I think there's Thank two you. different types of wind energy. One is the land-based, which we've already implemented, and you're talking about I'm thinking offshore wind energy. Correct. Uh, and uh, I think uh, I passed the House last year, and, and probably the President says it'll pass the Senate, and uh, uh, we'll have that legislation in, in force. So what would that mean? Who pays for that? What would it mean? Hey, who pays for it? Well, it means everybody's going to pay a little bit more, probably a dollar and a half more on your uh, monthly utility bill. Uh, you know, there are a lot of issues involved. I mean, I mean there are labor issues, uh, labor agreements, uh, minority ownership, minority participation, uh, the cost, especially to, uh, to people who uh, don't benefit from it. I mean, the whole, everybody benefits from it because Mother Earth benefits from it. The whole ecosystem benefits from it. But, but I'm not certain that it's going to benefit people in Western Maryland in terms of being able to benefit from it, but they're going to be asked to contribute. So, what, let me go back to the other side. Then I want to bring up some of the issues. Go ahead, please. Hello, my name is Jorge Aguilar. I work with a nonprofit called Food and Water Watch. That's a public interest group. Um, I want to first start off by thanking you guys for uh, your work on passing the bill to ban arsenic and chicken feed last year, which I know took a lot of leadership on your behalf, and I wanted to thank you for that. Uh, my question is actually related to the sort of flip side of the previous question, and it's in relation to fracking. Um, <clears throat> conversation in Maryland over the last three or four years, as you know, has really uh, centered around potentially uh, opening up the Marcellus Shale in Western Maryland. Uh, my question is related to, in the light of new findings by the USGS in May of last year, that there is, in fact, more shale in Maryland, including from, I think, both of your districts, going down from Anne Arundel down to Southern Maryland, uh, and another one in the Eastern Shore. I wanted to hear your thoughts on uh, legislation this year seeking to prohibit, uh, ban fracking altogether in the state of Maryland because of its inherent risks. And I'm sure you've heard it all before in terms of what's going on in Pennsylvania. In fact, I was just reading uh, Doug Gansler um, was potentially suing some companies in Pennsylvania for polluting the Susquehanna River. So. In light of this and what it'll mean to potentially making Maryland become an oil and gas state, I wanted to hear your thoughts on where this is going and if you support a ban on fracking. Look, I believe uh, we've had a, a full and fair debate on that in uh, Chairman McIntosh's committee, who, who you know is a very fair and very progressive on environmental issues. And, you know, we have a task force that's doing a study. I understand the governor's going to put the money behind that. We want to get all the scientific evidence before we make a decision. Obviously, there's numerous uh, uh, people within the, the state that would like to see that. There's other people that are adamantly opposed. But I think before you make any decision there, you have to have all the facts and uh, all the figures. And I think that's what uh, the governor has been very cautious about. And uh, when we get all that back, they'll make a determination of what direction the state will take. You know, what you have to realize is, is a lot of Marylanders not represented in this room. Uh, Southern Maryland, Eastern Shore, Western Maryland, uh, Maryland north of Baltimore uh, County. I traveled the state. I was at a Farm Bureau meeting uh, the night before last, and um, they took me to task on my votes for storm drainage, uh, Tier 1 through 4, confiscating their property by saying the state's taking over the zoning of the issues, all to protect the Chesapeake Bay and, and protect the quality of life in Maryland. Uh, with the fracking issue, Again, just like charter schools and public schools, there is a middle ground. If it's safe and it can guarantee to be safe, it's a source of clean energy, and we need to explore it and find ways to make it happen. Okay? Uh, Dominion Gas is going to build a, an export plant in Colbert County. It's larger than the larger project, project than the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, exporting natural gas coming from other states, Ohio and Pennsylvania, and we're selling it to Japan. Uh, uh, so there's got to be a bridge, there's got to be communication between the environmentalists and those people seeking to extract the natural gas, but there's got to be protections in place before we move forward. So if the Thank argument you. being around fracking also is that some people, I mean, if, if the, the science is being debated on fracking, right. Right. but there's a lot of evidence in that, in that science right now showing what happened in Wyoming and Pennsylvania, what it's done to people's groundwater, right. uh, the, the chemicals themselves being used to rush the, the gas through. Right. And to get it out. I mean, right. this is not this is not an uh, this is not a 
undangerous technology we're talking about here. Uh, we, we understand that. That's why we haven't gone forward with it. <laughs> so let me ask. Patricia and Governor Cuomo backed off on it and said, I want another study. Yes, good morning. Teresa good morning. Dudley and I teach sixth grade social studies in Prince George's County. Um, I received my AARP card this week because my 50th birthday is coming up. <laughs> so um, I will publicly admit that. Um, but what it brings to light is a, an issue that I'm very concerned about, and that is the long-term um, security of my pension. Um, last year, the pensions were pushed back on the counties. And I am concerned about the long-term effects. I understand that we just um, passed the casinos for Prince George's County, so we will be receiving some of those residual revenues. But that's not even going to open until 2016. And in the meantime, I have members who are concerned about the security of their pensions um, and making sure that our pension system is going to be one that keeps teachers in the classroom because people don't want to look for the future when there isn't one there for them. So can you please explain to us how you will ensure the security of our pension system for our educators in Maryland? I don't believe uh, anything has changed in your pension system because we shifted some of the responsibility and liability to the counties. The state still controls this, the pension system. It's just a question of, of who, who shares in, in the payment there. Uh, that did not change the, uh, huh? They're not even able to make maintenance of effort some of the school systems. So if they can't even keep up with maintenance of effort, how are they going to be able to withstand the pushback of these additional well, pension that, costs? That's why we give every county in the state of Maryland the piggyback tax. You can take up to 3.2% uh, uh, of the state piggyback tax, but 60% of what the state is for local government. We're the only state in the union that gives that. Uh, they can use their property taxes. They have an obligation to fully fund education just like the state of Maryland does. Uh, but the pension control still stays with the state of Maryland, and it's still the same pension system uh, that we had uh, uh, for years. What, what, the, 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 what you were talking about, though, with pensions, I mean, the, um, there's, the, there's that uh, the, the, uh, the uh, Joint Committee on Pensions coming out of the report, whether or not you'll follow those conclusions that they come out with in terms of uh, the, the future pensions. And, if, and the second part of that is if everything is pushed back to the county, not, not everything, things are pushed back to the counties, if the state can't figure out how to fully fund transportation right. start with, that in the state all across the country can't figure out how to address their, the, the, the needs, the budgets of their states, and, and we're one of those states. Um, so then, what, then what happens to the teachers in the end, if the counties, are, counties and cities are strapped. The so, pensions so are going to be end secure. Up, They're going to be secure. The only thing we do with do the is saying, look, if you want to pay these salaries, you negotiate the salaries and collect the bargaining. You have agency shop, you have binding arbitration, you negotiate these things. And if you're going to negotiate the salaries, then you've got to understand that pension is a part of it. It's as simple as that. We had no say or no control, and it's, it's doubling and tripling. It's all we're saying that those people responsible for it are going to have to share in it. Now, what we will do and what we're going to look at, we're going to work, work with the Teachers Association, the Educator Association on this, is we have a system of corridor funding, which, was, which, which we anticipate a higher rate of return in pensions than actually the, than the, there is. And we're going to try to eliminate that this year, just to continue to guarantee that your pension is going to be safe and secure, and there will be a lockbox for your pension in the future. The state still still has liability for 80 percent of the teachers' pensions. I mean, of, of the six billion dollars we put in education, 800 million dollars a year goes into teacher pensions funds. Uh, you know, and the comment about balancing the budget and states can't—we're one, well, we're one of a handful of states that have a triple A bond rating. We've made all the tough decisions. You know, you're looking at guys that, that have voted for revenues when it wasn't popular, and people are, you know, in positions like yours are asking why you're doing it. Uh, so, I mean, we've made the tough decisions. And we're one of the only few states in the <laughs> union that pays teachers' pensions. Yeah. Uh, you know, it started out with Baltimore City, and we figured you know, all the poor places like Somerset and Allegheny and everything, they should have that same opportunity. So the state picked up the cost of teachers' pensions, but very few states do that. Good morning. My name is Sarah Love. I'm the Public Policy Director for the ACLU of Maryland. Last year, uh, Speaker Bush and President Miller, uh, you all led the nation in protecting privacy and First Amendment rights by passing a bill prohibiting employers from requesting or requiring employees from turning over their social media passwords. Right. 
We are seeing across the nation that academic institutions are now pressuring students to turn over their social media passwords. Now, we all know that students don't handwrite letters like some of us still do, and that the way they do it is through private tweets and private Facebook posts. So my question for you all is, um, Will you join uh, the other states that are passing protections for students and uh, making sure that the universities can't pressure them for turning over their social media passwords? This is a new issue to me. I, I, I think we, we formed a, uh, a whole committee around uh, the majority leader who has probably the greatest expertise in uh, internet technology in the, in the House, along with Delegate Mazir and others. Uh, to come back with recommendations on those issues, and I'm sure we will do everything we can to protect uh, students as well as every other citizen in the state of Maryland. If you have one, so one more question, I'll try to squeeze one of my own in. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Dave Von Love. Um, so my question is about the issue of mass incarceration. Um, if you look across the country, there's increasing discourse around the issue of the disproportionate amount of people of color who are incarcerated for similar offenses to our white counterparts. And so looking at uh, the construction of a juvenile detention facility in Baltimore, I'm curious as to what your position is on the construction of that facility. I support the construction of a juvenile facility in Baltimore uh, because I don't want juveniles housed with adults. That's what's happening right now. Uh, juveniles in, in, in Baltimore City are housed with adults. It's unconstitutional, it's illegal, it's immoral, and, and something needs to change and change rapidly. I agree with the President's sense. Well, let me push a little bit further with, with the, the, the uh, question I was asking Dave on Love. I mean, when you look at the thing in its totality, I don't have like four or five minutes here, but this, we can answer how this is important. I think that, that the state has always had a difficult time dealing with reforming corrections, reforming juvenile services. Uh, I don't, and I would say that of all the things we've done great in the state, we've done an, an abysmal job with juvenile services and, and in, this, in this state. And that we lock up 60, 65% of the kids that we put in jail are there for nonviolent crimes, for things that most places, even states like Texas, have stopped putting kids in jail for the things we put kids in jail for. So is the, is the question building a new jail or changing the policies of incarcerating black children, which is what we're doing, because white kids get arrested for the same things and, commit, and use the same drugs but don't go to jail, but we're incarcerating all these black children and putting them in prison in Maryland, maybe we have to reform the system so we don't put as many kids in jail, then you wouldn't need a new jail. I wish you could sit in juvenile court. I'm I've a, been I, in juvenile I'm court. I'm a defense lawyer. I sit in juvenile court. I see, I see what happens in juvenile court. And honestly, truly, the kids that go to jail in Prince George's County are rare and, and very few and far between. And, and uh, quite frankly, uh, you know, I have a juvenile institution in my district, uh, Sheltonham. 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 And, um, you know, uh, you know, I support it. There's going to be a new facility, and it's going to be safe, and it's going to be secure, and there's going to be a school there. There's going to be computers there, and hopefully they'll, they'll, they'll learn what they're not learning in schools because right now they're not going to school. But the question is, some people would argue that what we have to do is have more community corrections. These kids stay in the community and are not incarcerated and put in prison for minor offenses, for drug offenses. We're talking about, kids, we're, we're talking about kids with guns. We're talking no, but about most, kids that's the, most kids in prison are not in there for guns. No, no, they're I, in there for, I have the stats right here. Right, they're in there for nonviolent offenses. They're not in there for guns. Shouldn't we be looking at how to reform the system so we don't put as many kids in jail? Look, I think... Uh, is, is burglary, is that a nonviolent... That's mean, a, that, if nobody's hurt. Breaking <laughs> home. <laughs> look, I've had my home broken into. Burglary is no, burglary, a breaking at home nobody, in, in the middle of the night with intent to commit a felony therein. No, wait a You're there with your nobody, wife and your kids. Wants somebody to have breaks a, your home in the middle of the night, comes, he comes to the privacy of your home. Nobody That's wants the to definition have the of burglary. And I've, my house has been burgled. I've been victim of crime. I understand all that. Stop it. But the question is, <laughs> the question is, what do we want to do with these kids? Do we want to keep right. locking them up? Or do you want to do like conservative right. states like Texas do, which is to stop locking kids up and, and, and kind of reform the juvenile justice system yeah, instead? We want to build better schools, give them a, a path to uh, a productive uh, place in society is what we want to do. And look, you know, we know there's challenges out there. I mean, you know, and uh, you try to work on all of them. We should start this way, it'd be more fun. But anyway, <laughs> President Mike Miller. Thank you. Speaker of the House, Michael Bush. Thank Mark you both so much for being here for the 10th Annual Annapolis Summit. Good to have both of you here. All right, bring out the boxing gloves or what? No, no. 
<laughs> I'm too old now. Maybe, maybe 40 years ago, not now. <laughs> Couldn't handle it. Uh, I want to thank both of you gentlemen for doing this once again. Uh, the 10th Annual Sem Stevens University. Of course, our, our co-host, Baltimore Business Journal. I'm Mark Steiner with WEA 88.9 FM, the voice of the community, and our other partners here and sponsors, Maryland State Education Association, Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development, and the Maryland, Maryland Business for Responsible Government. Thank you all so much. We're going to take a brief break, come back. When we come back after this break, we'll be talking to Governor Mark O'Malley. Don't go away. Hello, I'm Mark Steiner, and welcome back to the 10th Annual Annapolis Summit, 10 years here uh, at the Calvert House in Annapolis. Uh, and uh, we want to thank our sponsors before we begin. Uh, of course, I'm Mark Steiner here, WEAA 88.9 FM, the voice of the community. Uh, and uh, thank our sister station, Del Marvel Public Radio, who's also here. They will be broadcasting this, uh, the Mayor's Office of Cable and Communications, for taping uh, this program today and putting it on their channel, which we'll distribute around the state. We want to thank uh, our partners in this for the last 10 years, the Walmart Business Journal, that's celebrating their 30th anniversary this year, on the 10th anniversary of the Annapolis Summit, and the 20th anniversary of the Mark Steiner Show, all in one time. Uh, and I invite you all April the 6th to join us for a 20th anniversary Mark Steiner Show celebration. It'll be the best party of the year. You don't want to miss it. Um, and we want to thank our, our underwriters for the last 10 years, Stevenson University, uh, and our underwriters this year, the Maryland State Education Association, the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development, and the Maryland and Maryland Business for Responsive Government. And of course, once again, thank our partners, Baltimore Business Journal, for always being here and doing this with us. We're about to start our conversation with Governor Martin O'Malley uh, in uh, the middle of his second term as governor of the state of Maryland and just finished his term as chairman of the Democratic Governors Association. Welcome, Governor. Good to have you with us. Thanks, Mark. Good to be with you. So you're no longer chairman, right? Someone I'm no else longer chairman. I served for two years as the chair of the Democratic Governors and uh, was honored to have been able to do so. And in this last election, among the many really positive results that the voters uh, gave to us and that they decided. Uh, one of them was on the contested governor's races across the country where the DGA won in six of the seven contested races, including in some states where President Obama uh, was not even able to run a, uh, you know, launch a contested campaign. So it was a positive two years, and I'm very grateful to be able to serve with a talented <coughs> group of men and women who serve as the governors of our 50 states and also uh, territories and the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. And you also, I think, just, if I have a right, raise more money as head of DJ than anyone before. Well, we did. Yeah, right? And that was be thanks to a lot of hard work and a lot of diligence and a, and a real um, focus on the things that cut across all party, uh, all party lines. And we've, in a very concerted way, focused on one clear message, which was jobs, opportunity, now implicitly doing and the things and, and making the decisions necessary in order to create jobs and expand opportunity. And we found that was a, a unifying message uh, and one that every Democratic governor could carry and one that also appealed uh, to a broad uh, coalition of, of business leaders, small, medium, and large. So here we have the beginning of the session once again. You don't have the fiscal crisis you faced before. There are issues coming up. Um, a few I want to see the, the throw out very at the top of this conversation and raise some other issues as well and encourage our friends in the <coughs> audience, please, to go to the mic and don't forget when you go there, identify yourself, your organization if you have one, uh, and speak into the mic so we can hear you clearly uh, for your questions. Um, the death penalty, is it going to be in your state? You don't want to start with jobs? <laughs> no. I want to start with the death penalty. I'll start look with at education. <laughs> <laughs> Affordable college, <laughs> the innovation initiative. Uh -huh. So <laughs> moving 40 new ideas a year out of our uh -huh. labs and into the marketplace in order to create jobs. So wait, let me because straight. Mark, you know there is no progress is, without jobs. Is, is, that, is that is that where you want to start? <laughs> <laughs> so can I say by way of beginning? You can. <laughs> Just by way of beginning, that there really is no progress without jobs. <laughs> And, it's true. And every, you know, the, the, everything that we uh, will be focused on this session in some way, uh, it really has a connection to creating a state that's ever more uh, economically competitive, ever more economically dynamic and creative, and ever more inclusive. And certainly there will be crime and justice issues that are a part of that as we seek to improve security, improve the skills of our people, improve sustainability, improve the health of our workforce. 
But, but really what this focus, what the focus will be this session, as it has been in the past, will be on creating that innovative economy. Because without that, we would not have been able to uh, use the balanced approach and create jobs, reduce a structural deficit, uh, not to mention a recessionary deficit, and make the sort of strides on affordable college and, and the other and the other important uh, achievements we've made. And if I could, in concluding this introduction, uh, encourage everyone to go on to the state website, which is maryland.gov, and click on the icon that says goals. Uh, we set five years ago strategic goals for our state across those broad areas of skills, security, health, and sustainability. And some of those goals we've actually already achieved. We need to set new goals because with each goal we've applied a deadline. There are some goals that elude us. But the work of this session will be a continuation of the work of the prior sessions, and it will be primarily focused on jobs and, and opportunity. So what's on your mind today, Mark? <laughs> You're a tough man to pull away from the script, but I'm going to try. <laughs> um, let's start with the death penalty. Uh, is it going to be in your state of the state address? Is it going to be part of the legislative package to end the death penalty in the state of Maryland? Well, I, th I think that there's a renewed uh, interest um, b by a lot of the advocates um, to repeal the death penalty. I believe that if things don't work and that they're expensive and they're ineffective, that they should be prime candidates for us to repeal. And the death penalty is certainly in that category. It doesn't work. It's expensive, and I believe it should be repealed. We have reduced violent crime, including homicides, to you know, 30 and 40 year lows in our state, including last year a 30% reduction in juvenile homicides in just one year. So we know what works, and we need to do more of those things that work, and we need to stop doing the things that are expensive and don't work. So I, uh, I was... Uh, I, I was, uh, I'm trying to recall, Raquel, I believe it was part of our legislative package four years ago when we came up just a couple of votes short in repealing the death penalty. Um, my opinion on it has not changed since that time. In fact, I'm more convinced, especially given the lives we've saved by doing the things that work and Have reducing you crime. To it? Yes. Um. So one of the issues I know that you're going to, and I, both the Senate President and it seemed clear from the, talking to the Senate President and the Speaker earlier that it will most likely pass both houses if it's introduced. That's great. They, they as usual, have a head count ahead of mine. I'm sure they do. Which is why they are the longest serving Speaker and the longest serving Senate President. That's true, too. And as I asked them earlier, with that comes, with power comes responsibility because you've built a lot of power in 26 years, as you've learned fortunately, as governor. Fortunately for all of us. <laughs> um, one of the things, clearly, you're not, you're not going to face the kind of issues we faced in the session last year. Probably will not be two extra special sessions. Uh, probably, well, you never know. You never know. If there's another gambling <laughs> surprise in April. <laughs> Mark, did you think those things were planned? I don't know. No, they weren't uh, planned. No, I don't, I don't mean they weren't planned, but. The, the surprise we had at the, last, at the end of the last session, when everybody thought we were sailing along, all of a sudden, boom, <laughs> up comes gambling. Right. That kind of disrupted the entire session and sent See, everybody back. See, that's the backwards. first time I've heard that word so far. Which one, gambling? Yeah, so far this new year, that's the first time I've heard that word. Happy gambling to you. <laughs> Which is good. <laughs> you know, Secretary Clinton was in town uh, shortly after the, uh, the budget crashed and the session ended with such uh, gnashing of teeth. and and disappointment and she summed it up she was giving a talk over at the naval academy and she summed it up well and saying uh, she said you know you, you, you guys seem to have a really good session right up until the train crash <laughs> <laughs> but we got the we got the cars back on the train and fortunately the voters helped us put this one uh, that gaming issue behind us so we'll no doubt have other issues i'm, I'm excited about uh, uh, renewing our drive to create, you know, th three of the five strategic goals we have for our state are related to energy, energy usage, energy conservation, reducing greenhouse gases, renewable energy, and we're very close. And I think we will see this year the General Assembly approve uh, what, what might be called a, a hunting license to go out uh, and join with other states and maybe our federal government to harness offshore wind. So. I'm excited about that one, and I'm excited about other ideas the General Assembly might have for helping us reach our goals on those energy issues. 
I'm not sure if you saw the front of the Washington Post today, but one of the big headlines was that last year was the warmest year right. that we've had on record. And our state is the third most vulnerable to sea level rise. In that vulnerability and, and from that focus, however, I think uh, given the assets we have at uh, you know, NOAA and, and other places, that, that uh, there may well be uh, a new sector to emerge in terms of the sort of uh, design innovations, energy, uh, 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 severe weather response, and the assets that we have to create a new job sector in those disciplines here in Maryland, and Lord knows we need to. So one of the issues that is, I think is tangential to the energy issue is an issue that you have to face here in the state legislature, which is transportation funding. Um, part of the issue of uh, our air pollution, part of the issue of climate change is the amount of gasoline that we use, the roads we build to support them, the runoff that destroys our water. You saw the pesticide report coming out and what it says about what's happening to our rivers. Um, but the transportation fund, because it's not a constitutionally mandated fund where education is, has been rated so deeply, there's no money in it to, main, to maintain roads, let alone build what people want to build, which is mass transit. Uh, and the lines in the D.C. area and the new line in Baltimore, the red line, if it gets built, where's the money going to come from? How's that going to... I mean, that, we, I mean, that is a part of climate change in many ways, but also has to do with our transportation future. Um, and you, like every other governor, has taken money out of that to balance budgets. So... Not, not, not really to the degree that your frame would suggest. Okay, go ahead. And I think we do the public uh, grave disservice when we push the frame that we'd have plenty of money for transportation if only the lying, thieving, sneaky politicians didn't continually <laughs> raise the transportation fund. Also and it is a frame that, that's out there. And it's an easy one. It's a great one. It's a, you know, it's a simple story. It's easy to tell and retell. And it allows business leaders, it lets them off the hook. They don't have to contribute, therefore, to a large-scale media campaign to push across the truth that we have had a flat tax on gasoline for the last 30 years that has not risen, even though the price of everything else, including gasoline, has risen threefold. So uh, it is true that we did eventually in the course of getting through this uh, big recession, uh, we did stop the highway user revenue grants that went to the counties that was a, uh, ostensibly a, a local grant program. There's some that say, oh, that was part of the Transportation Trust Fund. But Mark, it was not out of those dollars that, you know, the uh, uh, <coughs> red line or, or purple line right. or those things. Uh, would be funded. And it's, and it's interesting, you saw the proposal on, in Virginia, in the Commonwealth of Virginia by their governor to address the same phenomenon, which is that if you have a flat tax on gasoline and it has not increased in 30 years, the buying power of that revenue stream is, is, is not sufficient to the needs of an area that has grown in population and that has the sort of congestion that ours has. So. On both sides of the Potomac, the, the congestion issue is the same. And fortunately, on both sides of the Potomac, the math is the same. Uh, there are insufficient revenues to support the things we need to do. Now, in other areas, and you mentioned education. Man, we've created the number one public, thanks to the hard work of teachers and uh, parents and administrators and citizens, we've been willing to pay some additional dollars in order to create the number one public schools in America. It never happened before, it's happened now. We've cut achievement gaps 25% just in the last six years. Steady, good progress because we made the investment. Uh, when it comes to water and wastewater infrastructure, uh, we, have done, uh, we have done things in advance of other states to invest in things like the, the flush fee, the flush tax, whatever you want to call that revenue stream that allows us to clean up the streams that emanate from our homes and eventually reach the rivers of the Chesapeake Bay. So, but on this issue of, trans, of infrastructure, we're falling short of what we need to do as a people, and it's not because the lying, thieving, sneaky no, politicians let me be clear. related to transportation. I, 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 said, I didn't think I used those words, did I? No, I was, I was using... I, I suppose hyperbole to make the point. I, I understand. As, that as, when we push the frame that the reason for our short funding, is, for our lack of transportation investment, is because we've shifted the dollars to other uh, implicitly lesser 
needs. It's just not well, well, true. I'm, let me see what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. And I, and I, you, I mean, I know you have to do it in the, in the Irish way. You have to put it out that way. I understand that completely. <laughs> but I, I, I was raised that way half of my family as well, so I understand. <laughs> Um, but I, but the, the, the issue is that states have not been able, to, our state as well, been able to figure out where to get the revenues to pay for the things right. that people want, education, whatever that happens to be. So money is moved, some have argued close to $2 billion from Transportation Trust Fund to other parts of the state to shore up needs and to make things work. So the question is, how does that money get back in? How do you fund the mass transit needs of the state? So we don't rely on roads and cars all the time, and we get the rail we're talking about. Some people are even talking in Baltimore about moving towards maglev. I want to see a maglev between D.C. and Baltimore. That's a whole movement being pushed as well. Um, uh, and, to, and to raise it, so, so, so how do we get there? I mean, how do we get there? And that also has to do with buying eco-friendly buses. We have 10 of them in Baltimore. They need to have hundreds in Baltimore and in DC, and the D.C. suburbs. So, so how, do we, how do we get there? Do we raise the gasoline tax? Do you, do you broaden the sales tax? Um, or do you just say, no, we can't do it? No, I think there's, the, the problem's not going away. Um, and I mean, w setting aside the highway user revenues, whatever dollars we shifted in one year or two, another year in this administration, I do believe, subject to fact check by Raquel, I believe we have paid back to the Transportation Trust Fund. Again, the highway user revenue grants, which some counties do and some counties don't use for road purposes. Uh, being a separate matter. I, it seems to me, Mark, that there's two ways you can go. And we had this discussion in advance of last year's session. Uh, one way, uh, I mean, the traditional way that we funded transportation is on gasoline. Right. Uh, Governor McDonald actually said a number of things that I, that I can say that I fully agree with. Uh, primarily that the gasoline usage is declining. And therefore, with that decline in gasoline usage from you know, from higher efficiency cars and alternative fuels and the like, uh, that is a revenue source that is also declining. Uh, so it, it would seem to me that there's two ways to go about this. Acknowledging the fact that we have had a flat and stagnant, you know, a, a flat uh, tax on gasoline. Uh, one way would be to, uh, to uh, somehow uh, continuing with that uh, gasoline mode, the commodity tax, uh, to be able to bring it up to keep pace with inflation, whether by indexing or phasing in the sales taxes we proposed last year as a way of indexing. So that's one way to go. Another way to go is to move entirely away from the gasoline tax and to look to other revenue sources, which will continue to grow by, you know, by population. And, and one of those would be the the sales tax. So, I mean, so the one way we talked about last year was to phase in, and we had a very intricate way of going about this. And every session in March, the price of gasoline spikes. It does. Every year, it does. So this is the worst time ever to have the conversation. Not that it's ever an easy conversation to have. I'm reminded of that scene from my cousin Vinny. When he's, you know, we could do an increase in the gas tax, which I know you hate. Um, <laughs> Or another way to do it would be to dedicate a penny on the sales tax. Maryland has, I think, the, uh, one of the lower sales taxes in the country because we don't allow the counties to layer on a local sales tax or the municipalities with the exception uh, of uh, sort of room taxes. So those would be the two ways to go. It w uh, the, the, we need to invest in the neighborhood of another seven or eight hundred million a year and in Virginia, a slightly larger state, they need to do a little more than, so, than that. So, what, what do you, what, so I mean, a penny generates a 700, and the proposal we had last year generates 700. So you're, you're governor. I you am. Have, you are the governor. <laughs> and you, you have to lay this out for the legislature, a proposal. Oh, it's been laid out. You're going to tell us, can you tell us what you're going to do? Uh, are, are you going to talk about a, a no, gas tax rise? No, I can't rise? tell you what, what you we're going to do right now. You're going to wait until the day you say it to the legislature. Uh, we're going to... Uh, we're still talking to legislative leaders, and we're, uh, we're working on a number of things. And if we're able to, if we're able to make a, a, a stronger and, and better annual investment in transportation, that too will help our employment picture and will help us create jobs. So we're still talking with presiding officers and legislative leaders. And, uh, 
and I'm sure all of the members of the House of Delegates in both parties are watching with interest our, our neighbors in the Commonwealth wrestle with the same issue. So the, let's put it, not, I'm not going to beat this, this dead horse here, but uh, so to speak. Um, but you are saying that you cannot resolve this issue without some increased revenue, whether it's sales tax, gas hike, the gas tax, which has not been raised in how many years in Maryland? 19, mm, 90, uh, you can help me out here, 1988 or 92 or something Yeah, 92, like I think, 92. 92. Um, and so, yeah, it when is 92. When the price of gasoline was $1.08, so, so today so, it's 360, 370. So one of those things has to be on the table. Well, right? true, there is no way to do it without additional revenues. Whether or not we have the consensus and the will and the smarts to do that or not remains to be seen. And um, we're already wasting a lot of money. We're, we're wasting an equivalent amount or probably more and promised to, to be more in the gasoline we waste idling in our cars and 495 traffic, 695 when it looks more like a parking lot. We lose money in terms of the lost time, lost productivity. We, we lose in terms of the competitive rankings of our region because of this congestion problem. So uh, we've already been, in a sense, we've already, we're, we're already um, saddled by circumstance if we were to do nothing with having to pay more. I'd rather see us pay, I'd rather see us avoid that expense by doing something that makes more sense now. Uh, and um, uh, which in the long term will be cheaper for all of us and better for our economy and better for job growth. So let, we're going to go to break in just about four or five minutes, but let's go to the audience first. Great. And I'll come back with some more questions after the break of my own. Um, please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Danielle Lipinski. I'm with the Maryland League of Conservation Voters. And first, we, I just want to say um, thank you so much, Governor O'Malley, for your efforts in combating climate change here in Maryland and your work for renewable energy. Um, and with all the momentum in the federal government to renew the wind tax credit and the new committee um, assignments, and more businesses are behind homegrown offshore wind than ever before, how are we really going to put Maryland in the forefront uh, and leader in this emerging industry? Well, I believe once. I believe that once the legislature votes and approves the wind bill which has passed the House, thanks to Speaker Bush and, and Chairman uh, Derek Davis and other leaders, I believe that once we get that wind bill to pass the Senate, I think that will open up um, you know, the opportunity for us to really go out and to, uh, to uh, put together the sort of multi-state and state-federal deal necessary to harness offshore wind. Uh, it, it can be a a new sector of our economy, both in terms of servicing the offshore wind and also perhaps in the building and assembling of the component parts of offshore wind. And it is, right now with the technology we have, the single most abundant renewable energy source available to our unique uh, geography as a state. So I'm excited about finally getting that one over the finish line, and I think we have the, the ability to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Time for one more question. I think before we go to break. Yeah, Don Rush from Delmarva Public Radio. Um, you suggested in the wake of the Newtown shootings, uh, do you expect some kind of gun control legislation coming out? Um, yeah. Do you expect some kind of um, gun control legislation coming out in the wake of the Newtown shootings? Assault on, say, for instance, uh, uh, ban on assault weapons or uh, magazines. What's what's your thinking there? I do. Uh, there is, uh, I, think, uh, I think that there has been a, uh, uh, a groundswell of uh, interest uh, and, and desire to, at the very least, restore the assault weapons ban that was allowed to lapse uh, a few years ago in Congress. And so, uh, I also believe that there's opportunities to, uh, uh, to promulgate, to, um, uh, to, to re-examine school security generally, uh, including the things that we can do with, uh, with some capital dollars to make our schools safer. And I also believe that the legislature is uh, very interested in tightening up uh, the linkage that should exist between mental health and public safety, especially where uh, firearms is concerned. So I think on all of the, I think you'll see a, a comprehensive bill being put forward uh, shortly, uh, and uh, that will 
touch that will address those three aspects of this problem. Do you expect anything coming out of the state legislature in terms of banning assault weapons? Yes, I do. I think that uh, I believe that there is the will to pass uh, a bill this session, and we all need to work hard for that passage. By the way, what was your reaction to the uh, to the NRA suggestion that we needed maybe teachers to have guns or more secure, security in the schools, perhaps people who are security personnel having guns? What's your reaction to that? Well, I, I visit schools pretty frequently, and there are already a number, I mean, we already have a number of officers that are deployed as, you know, com in some places they call them the community service officers that are deployed to our schools and that work in our schools. They are trained law enforcement professionals who have to uh, be recertified in their use of firearms as well as their other powers in, in order to continue to operate as public safety. I think the notion of of arming all our teachers with Uzis and AK-47s is repugnant to, uh, you know, the idea of the sort of more compassionate, kind, and free world that we're trying to create here in our country for our children. Uh, can you imagine what the gun belt would have to have looked like on the teachers at Newtown in order to repel that person who shot through their doors? Uh, there's, too, there's a deep sickness in our country, and it's called violence. And there is not another industrial nation that suffers from this sickness quite the way we do and our near worship of violence in terms of games and, and movies and, and guns. I think there are too many guns in this world, and I don't see any reason and have spoken to quite a number of very reasonable and committed and dedicated hunters, and we need more hunters. I want to encourage people out there, if they're interested in hunting, by golly, get into hunting, get a, get a license, and because that helps us preserve our natural resources and our open spaces as well. But the reason why AK-47s, Bushmasters, and these other military assault weapons are created, uh, their, their sole purpose is not for sport, is to kill human beings as quickly and as many as possible, uh, as, you know, effectively as possible. And so I believe that you will see uh, an effort this General Assembly session, and I believe that we will, in fact, pass uh, some measures that tighten up school security, the linkage between mental health and public safety, and also that restores the uh, assault weapons uh, ban that was allowed to lapse in years past. Just well, quickly, what, 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 we have to take a break, uh, and we're here at the 10th Annual Annapolis Summit at the Calvert House in Annapolis uh, with Governor Martin O'Malley, uh, WEAFM 88.9 FM, the Voice of the Community, and our partners of all of the Business Journal. We'll be back in just a minute. And welcome back. We're here at the Calvert House in Annapolis for the 10th Annual Annapolis Summit with Governor Martin O'Malley. Uh, and our live audience. We are partners again at the Baltimore Business Journal. Been with us for the last 10 years. This is our 30th anniversary, the 10th anniversary of the summit, the 20th anniversary of the Mark Steiner Show. Our continuing uh, underwriter for this event has been the Stevenson University for the last 10 years. They're with us again. Uh, and stay with us. Uh, we are also sponsored this year by the Maryland State Education Association, Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development, and Maryland, Maryland for Business for Responsive Government. And begin our session now again with Governor Martin O'Malley. Um, it was very impassioned what you said earlier about gun violence um, in, in our communities. And I, I, I like to kind of push on a little bit here. I think that there, there are a lot of issues. And we have a lot of listeners here who are uh, not listeners, but they are listeners, but they're also attending who want to ask questions. Uh, and I want to get them in here. So let me before, and I have at least four or five more things I have to get off my chest for the public with you, but uh, in a friendly way. But <laughs> always. <laughs> always. Um, let me go to the audience first. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Susan O'Brien with the University of Maryland University College. I wanted to thank the governor for his continued support of the university system, but I also wanted to hear a little scoop on any higher ed related um, policies or budget priorities you may have for the coming legislative session. Sure. We, Susan, we had a great meeting yesterday in, uh, at Morgan State. We had higher education leaders from various colleges, universities, community colleges. 
uh, all spending a day talking about what actions we need to take and what innovations we need to make and changes we need to make in order to do a better job of getting more of our citizens through college. We've done a better job than any other state over these last very challenging years of getting more of our students to college, but the challenge remains of getting our students through college and also helping people who may have gone to college for a couple years and then found because of family responsibilities or maybe they had a, uh, a couple had a child and, and they, one was not able to go complete uh, his or her degree, uh, we need to help our adult learners return and get those credits because there are so many, so many job opportunities that uh, uh, go unfilled because we don't have uh, enough uh, high, uh, people with the skills levels required to fill those jobs. So uh, do we, um, I believe we have an example here in our state, University of Maryland University College, the largest online university, public university, in the United States of America. And they do an outstanding job. And they do it with excellence. And they do it with uh, harnessing technology and the internet in order to personalize that education uh, mission for every individual whose uh, credit needs are different than others. Uh, so uh, we need to uh, borrow the best practices from not one another and find a way to, um, to speed that time to, to degree and also to bring down the, what has been the hyperinflation of higher education costs. Um, it's, it's not unlike well, let me say it positively. That sounded like lawyer talk. It's very similar to what we're, we're uh, striving to, to achieve where health care is concerned. Uh, we, um, the the hyperinflation in health care costs has been a drag on our competitiveness, and so too is the hyperinflation of higher education costs. Uh, so it's going to require us thinking differently about higher how higher education uh, is achieved and uh, the public role in helping to deliver that. One of the ideas that I've been intrigued with uh, that they've uh, been advancing in North Carolina is the idea of early college. And in fact, I believe that uh, College Park Academy here in, in Maryland and Prince George's County, they're advancing the same idea, and it is this. Uh, to add an additional year to a student's four years of high school, so make it a five-year program, but at the conclusion of those five years of high school, a student has earned two years of college credit. So I think that parents and students, and there'll be, there will be lots of people excited about uh, being able to, uh, to, to earn two years of college credit before you've even graduated from high school. Uh, so uh, um, yes, we do have to continue to invest as a people in higher education because the more a person, any person learns, the more a person earns and the better for our economy. Uh, but uh, we need to change the way we deliver uh, the higher education uh, skills. Not to, not, to, not to mention saving money for families in college tuition if, they are, if the student goes to college with two years under their belt. Oh, absolutely. So that's a huge Huge piece. benefit. There's no, so, uh, among the, among the uh, industrialized nations of the, of the world, uh, there, I, I do believe that we rank number one in terms of the expense we do. of college we education. Do. So let me ask this, because we're talking about education before we go to our next, um, our, our, our next audience member. Um, in the state, in terms of education, we have these new, this new core curriculum coming about. There's a lot, we won't get into the controversy of a core curriculum. That's another show, several shows, we'll do that. But um, Dr. Josh Starr, head of the Montgomery County School System, has suggested that we stop the standardized test for a period of, I think he said, two or three years. Um, and a pretty bold statement. He's gotten a lot of flack for it. But what he's basically saying also is that we have this new curriculum coming in, but the test we're testing our students on uh, is part of the old curriculum, so it has, no, it has no basis on, we have no basis to really test these kids, and B, that testing kids on this kind of student achievement, as he said, is just scientifically incorrect, and we're doing things backwards. So I'd like you to respond to that. I mean, because you, you are, of all the governors in this state, in the, in the, in the country, you have uh, a huge amount of control over uh, the State Board of Education. Oh, uh, don't you wish. <laughs> but you do, more than others. So I'm curious, I mean, and, and you, you appoint the state superintendent, right? So I do, so, eventually. So what, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Um, 
Actually, the school board appoints the state superintendent. But, you know but I'm, I'm very impressed with uh, Dr. Lowry. I think we have a great new school superintendent. And these are all things that she's working out. And I hope that uh, uh, Superintendent Starr will, will be able to work with us in a collaborative way as we figure these things out. I what mean, do you so think, though? What is, what is your take on this? I mean, where do, you, do you have a stand on it? Do you have a take on it? Do you have yeah. a sense of what you think I, is the right way to go? I think like so many things, uh, the challenge is always balance. I think that I think we do need to have some level of standardized tests that are that evaluate whether or not our children are are being educated with the skills that they need in order to compete with in a global economy with kids around the world. And at, at the same time, I'm sure there's always ways we can improve upon how we uh, evaluate their their achievement of those skills and also there's things we can do if we embrace digital learning that will allow us to uh, make, uh, to, to uh, personalize uh, the education mission for kids even in elementary school and, and high school. So, so much of these, so many of these things mark are like, you know, changing the tires on a rolling car. I mean, we can't stop everything we're doing until we have a core curriculum that's absolutely Absolutely. Fully implemented there, there's an overlap yeah. there. And, sure. and I was just thinking this quick, quickly, I don't want to stay on this, I'm going to get to our next, uh, our next uh, audience member, but you, you know, I mean, if you're a product of Catholic schools, I am. right? Um, and Catholic schools and private schools don't standardize test their kids. You know, they teach their kids and the kids come out whole. So are we missing something? Oh, uh, sure. I mean, we certainly have a lot of work to do as a, as a, as a country, not only in the education uh, field, but, you know, throughout in, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of uh, elevating conceptual thinking, the ability to see the whole picture, the ability to uh, problem solve, and the ability to understand the systemness of things rather than the individual things. I, I read something recently, I forget who wrote it, but he or she said that we're producing a whole nation of people that know more and more about less and less. The pendulum of specialization has kind of swung, and we need to appreciate the relationships between the relationships and the connectedness of so many things we do. And that's true not only in education, that's true in health, that's true in Security, where some of the greatest strides we've made in, in reducing homicides have come from knowing what we know, you know, appreciating who the most violent of our parole and probationers are, the most vulnerable of our juveniles. And uh, the same is true in terms of the skills of our people. So clearly there's lots of work that needs to be done, but there's, there's kind of a, a difference in the country right now between states who have embraced a common core curriculum and those that have rejected a common core curriculum. I think that by embracing the new global nature of our economy and our world, that we will better equip our students to succeed. And part of that will necessarily mean some standardized tests. And will there be kinks in the beginning? Sure. Will there be missteps? Sure. But together, we can correct these things. And, and hopefully, for a fifth year in a row, have the number one schools in America. I think curriculum is good. I wish we'd listen to E.D. Hirsch. He has the real answer to the core curriculum. But that's another discussion. Another day. Please, go ahead. <laughs> You're not E.D. Hirsch, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I set that up. No. Uh, my ahead, name please. is Davon Love with a youth advocacy organization in Baltimore called Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle. Um, my question to you, Mr. Governor, there's been um, much contestation over the construction of a juvenile detention facility in Baltimore. So along with what your position is on that, um, what is, I also would like you to speak to the phenomena of the mass incarceration of peoples of color, particularly African Americans, Latinos, um, being that all research has, has shown that racial groups commit crimes to their proportion to the population, and yet blacks and Latinos make up 66% of the entire prison population in the United States, and those numbers bear really similarly um, in the state of Maryland. So I want to speak to what your administration is doing and what your administration is willing to do to address that issue. Every day, I begin my day by receiving the overnight report from the Maryland State Police, which is a, a, a collation of all of the homicide numbers, every jurisdiction in our state. So that's how I begin every day. There is no uh, more important or primary responsibility 
uh, fundamental responsibility of government than the protection of public safety. And uh, in fact, it, you know, it, you know that it was the passion that drove me to even run for office to begin with. It was the passion that, that drove me to, to volunteer to serve as mayor. And it is also the passion that motivated me to, to run for governor. So we've made tremendous strides in saving lives. And if one were to look at the trends and the color of the skin and the ethnic background of especially the young and poor men who were filling those body bags at record numbers 15 years ago, the vast majority of them were black. So it's not unreasonable to conclude that the things we've done that are working in terms of the earlier interventions, the much uh, wider uh, access to drug treatment, and, and many other things, uh, better policing, uh, the violence prevention initiative, and, and, and the reforms in juvenile justice, uh, because those things have worked, we have been able to, re to, to save hundreds and hundreds of lives and uh, assuming the same trends, one can conclude that they would have been black lives, or rather stated another way, the lives we've saved have been mostly black lives. Uh, with regard to the juvenile, uh, the, the jail, there's a lot of terms that get mixed up here. Uh, let, me, let, me start, let me start broadly and then go more particularly to the, to the youth jail. Um, broadly speaking, <clears throat> for 30 years in the city of Baltimore, we had what most people recognized and all the smart people bemoaned as the worst addiction problem in America, and for 30 years we never built a single inpatient drug treatment facility. Not one. Not one. And we wondered why. Every year we had the most addicted city in America. So thanks to Paris Clendenning, we doubled drug treatment funding. Uh, we were able to build some inpatient facilities. And what we recognize in terms of freeing people from the bondage and the chains of addiction is that there are various levels of intervention that you have to have, a, what the health professionals would call a continuum of care from your sort of 28-day inpatient down to, or rather, down to the more shallow end of the pool, uh, you know, attending Narcotics Anonymous weekly and that sort of thing. And then there's interventions in between. When it comes to juvenile homicides, we allowed ourselves to be, in addition to being one of the smartest and wealthiest states in the country, to be the most deadly in terms, especially for young black people. And part of the reason for that was that we had no continuum of care from the deepest end of the pool in terms of the vulnerable children who are a danger to themselves and others who need to be detained, down, up to the shallower end of the pool, you know, your mentoring programs, Baltimore Rising, and the other sorts of interventions. Uh, even deeper than the deep end of the pool is the call of your question, which is the youth jail. Namely, uh, persons under the age of majority who are being tried as adults because they've committed very adult crimes. We had deplorable conditions there. A uh, recommendation was made, uh, in, in essence, under Justice Department, I think, kind of consent decree, perhaps court order, I think consent, uh, that uh, we should address those deplorable conditions. Because however uh, horrible and heinous the crime is that these youth have uh, committed, uh, they need to be, uh, the conditions are substandard. And so uh, we had thought that we needed to build a new jail. We might be able to get by with renovating the existing facility because we have been able with the things that we've been doing that are working to reduce the numbers of people that had been forecasted to come in there when that consent decree was first entered into some six or seven years ago. Uh, even if we do that renovation, we still have this problem. Nobody wants these smaller bed treatment facilities anywhere near them for young people. And so while I put those dollars in the budget for treatment, uh, I cannot get local jurisdictions, notably Baltimore City, through the terms of two mayors and a couple of different city councils to help us site a single youth treatment facility in a city that still buries far too many children. Governor, can I ask a question about this? Push a little bit sure. on this, the, what Dave Allen was raising. Is and thank you for your patience in that answer. No, no. Part of the question here for some people is that 
and you know, I, since the time you were a city councilman, you've, I've been interviewing you for 20 years. <laughs> My condolences. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for, for, tw <laughs> for 20 years. And on this issue, we've, we've struggled on this issue and argued and discussed and this issue a and lot. Policing. And police And race. Over the years. And so is, uh, what I tried to say at the very end of the last segment with President Miller and, and got into a little disagreement with President Miller over the issue was that why is it so difficult to reform our juvenile justice system? I look at the stats. 71% of the kids that we incarcerate are incarcerated for misdemeanors, not felonies. Right here. Right here. What are you looking at? 71%. DJS data. 70, 65% of the kids, all misdemeanors, others 5.8%. 17% for crime of violence, all of the felonies 11.4%. That, no, it's not, you're, you're so, feeding placements into incarceration. Right. That placement is not the same thing as detention or incarceration. But what I'm saying is, is that if, if we had a system, say you couldn't, say every, every community said, no, we can't, we're not going to let you put a, 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 a youth facility here. Mm -hmm. But if you had a treatment, probation, parole, education system that allowed kids to be outside of the system, you wouldn't need a new jail. You could take all the worst players, wow. put them in a jail, where they need to be, away from us, to be helped reformed and kept from hurting the rest of us, and really reform the system. Other states are doing it. Even conservative states like Texas do it. Why can't we do it? Well, actually, we are, which is why we have a smaller population than projected six years ago coming into the youth jail. And the number that you read on placements are, are mostly placements in, in treatment. And in fact, the dollars that we have put at an unprecedented level in the course of this administration in our capital budget uh, is primarily for, for treatment. So uh, we are reforming our criminal justice system. Are you happy and if with we, them? Am I happy with where we with are? With the pace of it? With what, where we are? I think most people would consider a 50% reduction in juvenile homicides to be that important one progress. I'm talking about kids. When, when, when you have... Well, there were kids. No, no, no. Well, they I'm, are what, kids what, that were saved. No, no, that's, that's deeply important. And I'm not minimizing that at all. And I think that's been incredibly powerful and important for our society. But when I think about <clears throat> the... Let's say there will be a bill that's not going to get... Probably will not pass state legislature, where, where Baltimore is asking for a 20-year commitment from the state so it can borrow money. Now why do you say that won't pass the legislature? Well, I had a sense talking to the two legislative leaders it might not pass. Well, you never know. You never know. <laughs> but if we're, but, but what, I'm, I'm curious. everything would take there'd be no need to <laughs> what, come down here. What, what kind of message it gives um, young people, and especially poor working class, mostly black folks in Baltimore, what message it gives if you say, we can't give you money to construct schools, but we can give you money for a jail? You know, Mark, I love you. I really do. <laughs> I really do. But um, it is such an easy frame. What do you that, mean? Well, the frame is that you disconnected cynical politicians who are no doubt paid off by the jail building industry, even though I've never we don't have... Have I ever done that? No. No. But, well, I won't do the hyperbole thing again, because that can... Uh, I don't believe in conspiracy theories, but I believe in good government. Yeah, so do I. And I encourage you to uh, look into the things your government's actually doing to reform <clears throat> juvenile justice. And look into the things that we've been doing to reduce the placement of vulnerable children uh, out of the home. The things we've been doing to restore the health of, of families and the whole place matters reforms that we implemented in DHR. I mean, uh, it is an easy frame that they're building jails for our children instead of building schools for our children. And uh, I understand the, the very, very, it's the best a white person can, the very painful history that, um, uh, that can make that frame more believable than perhaps it would be were it not for that painful and brutal history of slavery and the use of police powers to uh, brutalize minority communities. I, I do have an appreciation for that. Uh, but the truth of our situation here in our state is that um, we have actually been reforming our juvenile justice system and social services, and we've been making some tremendous strides. Uh, the graphs are moving in the right direction, 
in terms of increased treatment, although we still lack those smaller, secure 48-bed things that were all the rage six years ago. <laughs> and lots of legislators said, why don't you do like they do in Texas or these other places, or Missouri, Missouri. and Missouri. have the smaller 48 beds? So we put the capital dollars there and can't get anybody in the city to help us even cite one of them. Uh, so we still have that need. But while fewer of our children are incarcerated out of state, you know, or detained out of state than before. Uh, we've improved the conditions of the facilities in state. We're doing a met much better job of knowing which of our children are the most vulnerable and also the most potentially deadly. And there are fewer people incarcerated in Maryland today than there were six years ago. Let's go back to the audience here. One, we have about four minutes left, so I want to just very quickly ask you a very quick question, go to the audience for the last question here. I know that uh, you're going to be governor for the next two years. Thank you. God willing, as the <laughs> Jews say. Yeah, God willing. <laughs> we, know, we, we never know. Do you? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, we have to ask you this question. How seriously are you considering the run for president of the United States? Well, I think, I think, any, I think any thought of that would be, would be uh, you know, something you'd have to do seriously, but if the call of your question is how much time are you dedicating to no, that I, or how much time you do you spend on it, right? not really. I mean, I, there, there are other people that are paid to, to, you know, to talk about those things and talk about who might and, and who might not. Uh, and, and I don't really spend a lot of time focused on that, and I don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. I'm, I'm, doing, I'm, I'm doing some what I consider to be very important work that can help people in a positive way for many years to come. And I believe these next two years can be the most effective two years that I've had the honor and the, and the blessing to be able to serve the people of our state. And I'm going to make the, the, you know, the, the most of this limited time that I have. And I consider myself very, very fortunate, Mark, that I'm able to serve the people of our state. Because what we've done, you know, down the road they talk about a balanced approach, but here for six years it is that balanced approach that allow, has allowed us to make the progress on public safety, on public education, and, and opportunity. So, um, you know, I don't, I, I'm, <clears throat> I appreciate your question, and I am humbly, you know, and, and I'm, I, it, it's a humbling question, and um, I would say that I'm flattered by it, except that I know whatever good we've been able to achieve as a people is attributable to the people of our state and, and their goodness and their desire to create a better life for their kids. And I've just had the honor to be able to reflect that goodness along with the members of the General Assembly as their servant. Governor Martin Malley, it's always a pleasure to have you up here since Annapolis. I, mean, I apologize, people waiting in line. Good morning. Um, we only uh, have like a minute left, okay. literally. Uh, it's quick. It's just the um, rapid fire. Good morning. We'd like to, I'm Tammy Bresenhan with AARP Maryland. Uh-oh, I know where this is going. No, 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 I'm not gonna put you on the spot even though I know your birthday's this month. Um, <laughs> Uh, first, we'd like to thank you for supporting and implementing the Affordable Care Act in Maryland. Thank you. Um, just want you to know that, um, or that you probably do know, that people 50 plus are outpacing uh, children in school age children or children in school today. And according to our 860,000 members, when they're surveyed, the three things that they're most concerned about is health care. Um, retirement security and their affordable utilities and we want to make sure or we want to know in your opinion what Maryland is doing to prepare itself for that influx of people as they age and so that they can remain in their home as they want to. Okay. Wow. And in 10 seconds or less. 30 seconds or less. Well, it's a, big demographic, uh, it's a big demographic shift in our country. I think the Affordable Care can help us with this. I think we need to uh, uh, do everything in our power to uh, uh, encourage uh, people to, to stay in home as long as they can and uh, hopefully help uh, restructure uh, some of the caregivers so that... Um, you know, so that we can have more home health care, uh, which is the same movement, I think, when it comes to, to health care in general. And we'll pick up those questions. I'm sorry, I can't do better than that. In oh, no, that's right. Mark Sonich will pick up those questions, all the rest we couldn't get to today in the coming months. I want to thank Governor Martin O'Malley for coming to the 10th Annual Annapolis Summit. Good My to have honor, you, Governor. Mark, good to be with you. Always good to be with you. Thank the Calvert House for hosting us, and of course, our partners, the Baltimore Business Journal, uh, for the last 10 years. 
uh, doing this with us. It's without them, it couldn't be done. Uh, Stevens University has been uh, underwriting this for the last 10 years and been our, our academic partner. Uh, we want to thank the Maryland State Education Association, the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development, and the Maryland Business for Responsive Government. And of course, I'm Mark Steiner for 88.9 WEAA, your public radio station. It is yours, uh, the voice of the community. Uh, take care. Thanks for joining us. And uh, see you next time.